Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for spending this afternoon, if it's afternoon in your time zone with me. It's four o'clock on the nose, on the button in Philadelphia, where I live. Um, and I'm so happy to welcome you to today's Essential Vegan Desserts live event. It's a topic that I'm very interested in. Um, chocolate, what's new in chocolate? Because there is quite a bit of new information. And, you know, one of the things I've said this before, but one of the things that I love the most about being in the culinary world is that there's always something new to learn. So we teach and focus on foundational technique in all of the Ruby courses, including essential vegan desserts, because you need to learn foundational technique before you can move on. But it's so wonderful to have the opportunity to learn and discuss what's new. Before I get started with the topic, because it's there's a lot to talk about today, I want to say that I'm very excited that this is the first day of spring. Anyway, in my hemisphere, it is. We had almost, we had 75, 76 degrees Fahrenheit the last few days. And today, the first day of spring, it's in the 30s. Um, but there are flowers blooming. So you might hear me sniffing a little. Allergies are popping up. I'm still very excited about it. I want to welcome everyone, uh, Ruby students, my essential vegan dessert students and guests. Anyone here who's in essential vegan desserts uh, who has just started, I've noticed that I have a number of new students and I'm always excited to meet new people and work with them and people who finished the course or are somewhere in the course, remember to join the private Facebook group. We have a really vibrant um, community there and it's a great place to ask about equipment, show some of your work that hasn't been submitted or maybe has been submitted. If you have a problem of a technical nature, just write to support at ruby.com and they will help you out really quickly. And everyone here, please remember that you can write to me at fran at ruby.com. Um, my essential vegan dessert students, if you, for people who are on Instagram, use the hashtag essential vegan desserts at Ruby plants so we can find you. And I also want to shout out an essential vegan desserts graduate, Angie Alcair, who lives in Alaska, won a big award she, for her most creative desserts in a chef challenge for her vegan desserts. So you might want to look for pure and simple desserts on Instagram. Her work is exquisite. Congratulations, Angie. Now, in terms of chocolate, the main event today, some of you may have already heard me say this over and over again, but it bears repeating. Chocolate is a bean, but it is not a salad. So <laughs> that's the way I approach desserts. They are treats. Now, I know that some of you are um, familiar with the work of Dr. Dean Ornish, and he has written in all of his books and talks in his presentations about the fact that he eats a square of dark chocolate that's high percentage chocolate every single day. I just, before I get into the what's new, and I've got lots of things to show you that are new, um, I want to review, do a review of chocolate. Now, what makes chocolate vegan? I get that question pretty frequently. And, you know, I did write a book called Vegan Chocolate, Unapologetically Luscious and Decadent Dairy-Free Desserts. Chocolate is vegan when there are no milk products whatsoever of any kind and the sugar is vegan. And I want to go over what that means in more detail. But first, I'm going to ask Patrick, our wonderful producer, to show you two short videos that show take, you know, how chocolate is grown and processed 
So let's get started with that. Chocolate is made from the seed or bean of the tropical cacao tree. The largest production of cacao trees occurs along the tropical belt around the equator, about 15 to 20 degrees north and south. There are three major types of cacao trees, Criollo, Forastero, and Trinitarios. These finicky trees demand a constant, balmy climate, humid air, and damp soil. The trees first form delicate cocoa flowers. If the conditions are perfect, the flowers will start to grow into cocoa pods. The trees start to bear fruit around year 3 and are fully productive by year 10. Pods, ranging from yellow and green to deep red in color, are about 14 to 16 inches long, oval in shape and pointed at one end. It takes about 5 months for a pod to fully ripen before being carefully cut off the tree by hand. Each pod is packed with approximately 20 to 60 seeds or beans, which are embedded in a juicy, sweet, tart, white-pinkish pulp. The beans are bitter and inedible when raw. Many trees only produce about 4.5 pounds of beans per year, which is not much as it takes about a half a pound of roasted beans to make about 2 ounces of pure chocolate. Once the pods are ripe, they must be processed to bring the beans to an edible state. The pods are first split, and then the beans and pulp are scooped out. They are then carefully fermented for five to seven days. Fermenting is a crucial step in developing the flavor, aroma, and essential oils in the beans. Quality will vary tremendously if the beans are under or over-fermented, so a farmer must know what they are doing. During fermentation, natural yeast chemically changes the beans in pulp, which is crucial in developing the initial chocolate flavor. The beans are then carefully sun or artificially dried to develop flavor and reduce the amount of moisture. They are then cleaned to remove any dirt or impurities before being graded, bagged, and shipped all over the world. The manufacturer then carefully roasts the beans at precise temperatures. Roasting reduces bitterness, further develops the flavor and aroma, and gives the beans the desired browning. During this process, the water content decreases even more and the husks become loosened. The beans are then processed to separate the husks from the prized cocoa nib inside. Large, heavy presses or mills are then used to crush the nibs. The nibs are ground and refined into a thick, non-alcoholic paste known as chocolate liqueur or cocoa mass. If the cocoa mass is squeezed by hydraulic presses and filtered, this mixture will separate into about 53% cocoa butter and 47% pressed cocoa. All right, so now you have seen, I imagine that some of you are familiar with the process of these beautifully colored I think cocoa pods are so gorgeous. And you can see that it's very straightforward. It's lengthy and difficult work, but that's really all that chocolate is. Now, I said before the videos that what makes chocolate vegan is the absence of milk or any milk products and the sugar needs to be vegan. So people ask me all the time, what makes why wouldn't sugar be vegan? Well, talking about cane sugar here, cane sugar in, is processed using or conventional cane sugar, not vegan cane sugar. Bone char is used in the processing of cane sugar. Now, bone char is a porous granular material that is actually produced by charring animal bones and it's used as a decolorizing filter. Um, now, bone char is made from the bones, I'm reading this because I wanna get it right, bones of cattle, but it's heavily regulated by the European Union and USDA. So only countries that are deemed BSE free can sell the bones of their cattle for this. Now, it's not, you know, I'm vegan and I don't want bone char, AKA charcoal. 
in my sugar. And because I'm using vegan sugar, and so one of the things, if you're interested in vegan chocolate, you're going to see on the package, it's going to say organic sugar. So organic sugar, fair trade sugar, vegan sugar will not be absolutely pure white. They will have a little bit of a blonde color depending on the brand. And they, that is not processed with bone char at all, which is why it's got a slight color and a slight flavor. Now, beet sugar, which was very popular in Europe, was never, is not filtered through bone char. However, the problem with beet sugar for me is that almost all of the beets grown in this country are genetically modified. So there's plenty of vegan cane sugar available. When you're using a, what's called a whole cane sugar, like um, Rapadura or dehydrated cane juice, those are not filtered. So now we know about the sugar. Why would there be milk in dark chocolate? I used to think, well, if it's not milk chocolate, then it's vegan, but that's not true. So to be absolutely sure that there are no traces of milk in your chocolate, which is, you know, milk in your chocolate, it will say perhaps made on shared equipment. This is can to have milk in a dark chocolate bar can be annoying to ethical vegans and can be deadly for people with milk allergies. What you do is you look for a manufacturer that only makes dark chocolate, that it's a dedicated milk-free facility or kosher non-milk chocolate. So that's what you want to do. Um, Ethical chocolate is another situation, and I have noticed, and you may have noticed as well, if you're a chocolate aficionado, that most of the big players in the business of chocolate are all going to labeling that says fair trade, ethical. Um, they have different certifications and a lot more transparency. And that is because there is still slavery, child slavery used in the production of chocolate. So with vegan chocolates, and that's what we're really talking about today, like any other food product, you have some really fabulous ones and you have some not such good ones. Um, read labels do some tastings. Don't expect all 70% chocolates to taste the same because they won't. Now, what I have noticed is that you've got chocolates labeled gluten-free today. Chocolate, if you think back to the video, there is nothing in the production of chocolate that would make it contain gluten but you want, of course, there's always an issue of cross contamination and you've got to watch out for inclusions because many chocolate bars, candy bars have inclusions that can have gluten in them. And paleo chocolate, maybe you have seen some paleo chocolate and you know some of these labels make me smile a bit, but Hue chocolate, which is a chocolate that says organic and paleo, no refined cane sugar, no erythritol, no soy, gluten, no palm oil. It is sweetened using coconut sugar. So that's what makes it paleo. Now, Hue is only one of many companies using coconut sugar to sweeten their chocolate. Um, I've tasted a bunch. I actually like the hue the best for me, the coconut sugar flavor, which is a flavor that I like. It's to me, it reminds me a little bit of caramel, a little bit of molasses. I, in fact, I use it often in place of molasses. I don't always like it with chocolate, but 
you know, this is personal. We all have different ideas of flavor. Now, the other really, another really big thing is you have probably seen vegan milk chocolates in the marketplace, and there are so many. So vegan milk chocolates are made with oat milk, coconut milk, almond milk, or a combination. And again, I've tasted some where I didn't want to, you know, I took a little teeny taste and that was enough for me. And I've tasted some that were absolutely delicious. Recently, uh, an Israeli brand called Seventh Heaven launched in the U.S. And I think it is sensational to me. But it's a candy bar. It's a candy bar. It's a flavored bar. And Dr. Bronner, the soap people, has also got a line of ethical, vegan, Seventh Heaven is as well, oat milk bars. That's really, I find them very tasty, but again, they have inclusions. I've seen Trader Joe has, um, Trader Joe's has oat milk bars. I think Chef Charnolin, who may be here, told me to taste one. Here is an almond milk. These are just wrappers of, from Taza chocolate that I remember liking a lot. There's nothing in there. And this is an almond milk quinoa crunch bar from Taza. That was very good. Very good. So you can go and find the chocolates. And, you know, I've had little chocolate tastings with some of my friends and neighbors because there's only so much chocolate I can taste. And I have one palate and I want to know what other people think as well. So you, you want to do tasting, you want to read labels, and you want to find the chocolate that you really like. Remember that the higher the percentage of chocolate, cacao or cocoa that's listed on the label, and almost all of them now say, or this one says 65%, it's from Chocolate Love. I, I have all these labels, but I also have behind me three containers full of chocolate. Um, we'll tell you now, here's one from Whole Foods, 71%. Chocolate liqueur, which you know is the cocoa mass, sugar, cocoa butter, cocoa powder. I don't know why there's cocoa powder in here except to save money uh, to bulk it out. And it is whole trade, so it is fair trade. And here's a Theo 85% that is uh, cocoa bean, sugar, ground vanilla bean, organic, and fair trade. So it doesn't have anything. Most chocolate or a lot of chocolate has an emulsifier and lecithin. So if allergies are, if allergies to soy are an issue, then you want to find a chocolate where the emulsifier is sunflower. And that seems to be something I'm seeing more often. Now, the holy grail of vegan chocolate, as far as I'm concerned, has been vegan white chocolate. I don't love white chocolate. I will be honest with you. It, I just find it too sweet. And the many of the lesser quality dairy, v, dairy white chocolates, white chocolate should be made with cocoa butter, which is the fat in the chocolate and sugar and some other ingredients, some emulsifiers, but um, I find them very sweet. And the less expensive brands are making white chocolate with fats, liquid fats and solid fats and so on. So white chocolate contains little cocoa mass, except for the cocoa butter and almost always contains milk or cream powder. So it's not suitable for us, but <laughs> this is something that is new and manufacturers, vegans are creating vegan white chocolate. So I'm going to pull some now. I've got some good news and some not such good news about one I like. This is, this brand is called Vigo White. Now some of the vegan white chocolates are also called blonde because of the sugar 
used. They're not going to be pure white. And this one is made with almonds. So a lot of the vegan white chocolates are going to be a problem with people who have allergies to nuts. This is Enjoy Life. And some of you know that Enjoy Life is certified gluten-free chocolate. They've got a white chocolate chip now. Um, I find the white chocolate chips, I was using the kosher white chocolate chips because that's all that was available when I needed white chocolate. And I used very little white chocolate, maybe for a little decoration. They are very waxy tasting to me, just waxy and sweet. And there is another certified gluten-free company that has a vegan white chocolate. I'm not going to say who it is, but I will tell you that my grandsons who like things sweet said, ooh, wax. So you've got to do some tasting. This is one you can see from the label that I've had it a really long time. It's it's uh, And it says vanilla confectionery bar using alternative milk. And it's made with rice milk. So it's raw cane sugar. Again, take that raw <laughs> with a grain of salt because there is no raw. Cocoa butter, rice syrup, and vanilla. It actually tastes pretty nice. The one that I like the most, and I was going to give you a link to it, is Lagusta's Luscious. Lagusta is an artisan chocolatier in Hudson, New York area. You may have seen her work. She's real busy now getting ready for Easter, I know. But she makes a beautiful or made a beautiful white chocolate. And if anyone is familiar with 11 Madison Park, which is a vegan Michelin star, all vegan restaurant in New York City. I think a meal is about three, $400, uses Lagustas. So I phoned them up yesterday because when I went to the website to get a link for you, if you wanted to order the chocolate, it, the chocolate wasn't there. And um, the fact is that they are redoing the recipe, so it isn't available right now. However, Valrona, which is a very fine chocolate company, has, I want to put my gloves on. Well, actually, I have them in here. Um, has these, it looks like white chocolate. It's mostly cocoa butter and fruit. And they call them the inspiration line. This is passion fruit. It is so delicious. I can't begin to tell you. And this is the one that is raspberry. And Valrona has just come out with a new white chocolate. I haven't sampled it yet, but based on these, which do not contain nuts, it's going to be sensational. Their new white chocolate, though, does contain almonds. Um, so if nut allergies are a problem, that's going to be a problem. Felchin, that's F-E-L-C-H-L-I-N-N, has a white chocolate as well. Comes in 11 pound tubs through Worldwide Chocolate and needs to be tempered. And it contains rice milk powder, coconut, and almonds. And I haven't tried it, so I can't pass judgment on it, but I can tell you that these Valrona inspirations are great and they are really expensive too. So you want to use them. I mean, I want to make things with them, but I also love munching on them. So that is pretty much what I think I want to tell you now. I saw some very interesting questions. So I'm going to go right into the chat now. And if you haven't put a question in yet, and you would like to ask me a question, there is on the right side of your screen, a place to do that. So let's see. In the chat, I put the a link, an Amazon link to the Valrona Passion Fruit 
curvature, the fevs, that's what those little pieces are called. You can order direct from Valrona, but this was an easier way for you to have a look at them. So Sharon B has a question. Hi, Sharon. Sharon wants to know if I can provide a few favorite sources for good quality yet child labor free cocoa and vegan bars. She's been watching too many documentaries. Well, yes, if you Google child slavery in the production of chocolate, you're going to see quite a lot of overwhelming and just horrible, horrible um, documentaries about what really goes on, you know, at best, the production of cocoa, of those beans. You're in the jungle, it's hot. <laughs> you're using machetes, it's dangerous. It's just awful. So, Sharon, if you were here when I was, um, Speaking a little earlier, there are a lot of the good quality vegan chocolates that are ethical and fair trade. And in the chat, I put a link to foodispower.org. It is their chocolate list and it is a list that's kept updated. And you can, there's even an app, you can have it on your phone so that when you're shopping, you can actually check a, you know, their list against the chocolate that you're looking for. Now I found, I think it was last year I was looking at the list and someone who I know a, a manufacturer, a chocolatier that was absolutely ethical, wasn't on the list. And I contacted them and they updated it. So I'm just going to, um, Emery has a very important question. I'm going to skip over it for a minute. Uh, I have a question here. Does freezing tofu diminish its nutrient value? Not at all. In fact, some people say it makes the nutrients even more available. So I don't know about that. It gives you a different, a different texture, but go ahead and freeze your tofu and enjoy it. And also, um, the same person wants to know, does adding nutritional yeast to a dish while the food is cooking diminish the nutritional value of the yeast? And that's a yes, it does. Nutritional yeast is loaded with B vitamins and they will degrade when they're being heated. So I, I happen to love nutritional yeast. We call it nooch. <laughs> if you know, you know. And so I add that after. Anne Marie has a really important question here, and I'm just started reading more about this, and I'm very sad about it, really. So the question is, how safe is it to use chocolate given the data that has been published, and this is recent, about the heavy metals such as lead and cadmium contained in chocolate, especially dark chocolate? So if you haven't heard this, it seems to be a thing. I mean, people are, and Teresa's asking the same question, how concerned should we be about lead and cadmium in dark chocolate? I have um, a link, or I'm gonna tell you actually where to find it. And if I don't find it before the end of this live, I will put it in the link so you can get it. It, you know, there is cadmium naturally occurring in the ground. So some of our foods are uptaking it. They, the researchers don't know how the lead, where the lead is entering the equation. They're kind of guessing about it right now. Consumer Reports did um, an article talking about this and listing brands with, they color coded it, high cadmium, high lead. And it really is an issue. And a lot of our favorite chocolates are on the list, which is, you know, which really shook me. So I would say I feel comfortable eating chocolate and giving chocolate to little children. There are scientists saying don't give any chocolate, any dark chocolate to children. There is less of these um, 
heavy metals in milk chocolate or lower percentage chocolates, then you've got more sugar, of course. Um, but as I said in the very beginning, chocolate is a bean, but it's not a salad. I eat little bits and I don't eat it every single day, despite the fact that I wrote a whole book about it and have all this chocolate behind me because I'm always testing. But I want to show you something. So I do like desserts and <laughs> I like making them and I like eating them, but my desserts are smaller than most, than many desserts in the marketplace. So for example, here is a little date and peanut bar coated with some dark chocolate. This is a gluten-free brownie bite dipped in high percentage chocolate ganache. And I've got a walnut on there. Oftentimes I put fruit on there. I want to get some nutrition in, you know, into the desserts where I can. Um, however, there's still dessert. And here I've got some little mandarin oranges. I've been citrus crazy lately. And I just dip them in some chocolate ganache. Actually, we have a dipping assignment in essential vegan desserts. That's very, very interesting. So what I would say is to find these lists, talk to the manufacturer. I'm actually going to several manufacturers to discuss it with them. I noticed a few chocolate makers that I like were not on the list. They're not complete. I think this is something that's going on masked chocolate that's mast was listed as very low um and what they're doing is they are not using single origin as a way to try to uh work around having this heavy metal you know sky high it's this is an ongoing story and i i think they have to figure it out as i said they they don't know where the lead is entering the the chocolate where that's coming from the cadmium is in the ground in the same way that you know we had this situation with other foods like brown rice recently so to be continued and thank you for asking those important questions jane b wants to know what type of vegetable oil do i recommend for the ganache cake i use primarily two types of vegetable oils in my cakes and in in my baking in general so i'm going to show you two bottles that are going to look the same but you're going to see one is labeled differently this is extra virgin olive oil and it is mild flavored i will use a more strongly flavored olive oil for an italian cake for example but i don't want the oil to have a flavor most of the time. And then this one, it says organic sunflower oil with the date label. And I suggest you label and date. And my oils are kept in dark glass bottles. I really like using sunflower oil. I think it has almost a buttery taste. I also like, um, I will use grapeseed oil sometimes. In my first cookbook, I used canola oil because that is a neutral oil with a good, um, healthful percentage. But on, on, then I learned later on that unless canola is organic, it is genetically modified and processed with chemicals. So sunflower, grapeseed, and extra virgin olive oil. Um, Beth wants to know, oh, she loves chocolate. Chocolate's the best ingredient. What's the best brand of vegan dark chocolate on the market to date? So Beth, you might have seen me with <laughs> all of these labels. And then over here, I have all of these bars. I've got Choco Love, Theo. This is something that I picked up when I was out with 
Chef Char Nolan, who if you're a Ruby student, surely you know Chef Char. And I think she took me to Aldi supermarket, which I had never been to. And I bought two of these bars because it says fair trade and it, no high fructose cor corn syrup, which shouldn't be in chocolate anyway. <laughs> no certified synthetic colors, which shouldn't be in chocolate anyway, but the, you know, it's chocolate liquor, sugar, and soy lecithin. There is some cocoa powder in here, so I'm seeing a trend which shouldn't be happening, but that bar is delicious. So the right chocolate to use is the one that meets your requirements for if you care about ethics and flavor. We do, you know, you have to taste some chocolate and decide which one you like. So I don't have a best brand for you. I do like Velrona very much. Um, I like Belcolade, which is a Swiss chocolate that's available to the trade only. Um, oh my gosh, I like some guitar. I like some of the supermarket brands too. So do a little tasting and decide. I hope that helps you. Clive wants to know if I use agave to sweeten chocolate. So Clive, I'm not really sure what you mean. If you mean when I'm making a chocolate frosting or cake would I or glaze, would I use agave? Um, I use agave very little, actually. I use it in combination with rice syrup and maple syrup to make a kind of vegan honey. And there are one or two recipes where I use a little bit of agave, but I find it very sweet and it doesn't bake well. So I, I don't really, if you want to put another, you know, comment in the chat and tell me specifically what you mean by that, I would be happy to try to answer it. I mean, I wouldn't use agave to sweeten cocoa powder, hot cocoa, for example. Hi, Kathy. Kathy C wants to, is saying that she's been reading the about the use of potato protein in place of aquafaba meringue and in vegan buttercream. Um, I, Kathy, I haven't used it. Uh, I, many people do, Chef Carolina Malia, who makes these gorgeous vegan macarons, for example, um, and did a masterclass that I think some of you may have taken, uses it. There is, you know, the, the French style vegan pastries, those chefs are using ingredients like potato protein and other ingredients that I don't use. And the only reason I don't use them is my desserts are simpler and I am still using what I call whole ingredients to make my desserts or standard ingredients. So no, I haven't. Um, I know that it, this potato protein for a while was really hard to find because so many people wanted to use it. And it's in this country, it's provided by a company called Sosa, S-O-S-A. But I did see it recently on Amazon in a smaller size. It was still $60. But if you want to try that, then you go ahead and try it and let us know. Hi, Holly. Holly says, I love dark chocolate, but it often has oil and processed sugar in it and is a high caloric density do low caloric density chocolate treats exist? Or is it a higher CD treat to be enjoyed occasionally? Well, I think all desserts, uh, all sweets, and I would put dark chocolate in that category are treats um, to be enjoyed occasionally. Now, chocolate should not have oil in it. And none of the bars that I showed you had any oil. Chocolate is cocoa mass, also called cocoa liqueur, and sugar. And we're, because we're doing organic vegan chocolate, so that would be organic cane sugar, which is less processed, or a brand like Hue, uh, which uses coconut sugar. 
but no oil. There should not be oil in your chocolate bars. Um, Kristen says, I know you love chocolate, but do you have recommendations for substituting cacao in recipes for those who are caffeine sensitive? Kristen, as far as I know, <laughs> cacao has caffeine. Now, the ca I'm assuming that you, you're talking about the powder here. So, for example, I've got... I've got all of those are cocoa powders. This is one Coco Rouge. And this is one from Divine, which is a fair trade. These are all alkalized or alkalized or Dutch processed cocos, meaning they've been processed with an alkali and they're smoother. Cacao is a powder that is said to be raw, but it's not. There is no such thing as raw chocolate. Many of you have heard me say this before and more than once. It's unroasted chocolate. It is not raw. There is no such thing. So my students in essential vegan desserts do, for example, an assignment where they're comparing a natural cocoa powder, non-alkalized, with a Dutch process, making a hot chocolate, and then comparing and contrasting them. Any non-alkalized cocoa powder is, this, is going to be the equivalent of cacao. So you find yourself a recipe for you find yourself a recipe that uses cocoa powder that is a natural cocoa powder and there are plenty and then go ahead and substitute it now i don't have anything to back this up off the top of my head but i was taught that the caffeine is tied into the amount of fat in the chocolate and cocoa powders tend to be very low fat so there you go. If you are really caffeine sensitive to that extent, maybe chocolate, cacao, cocoa is not the best thing for you. Hi, Chef Char. So here is our Chef Charlene Nolan, instructor at Ruby, and she wears a lot of hats. And I'm very happy to say Chef Char is my friend. And Char, I want to show you. Chef Char brought this beautiful handmade bowl back from Puglia in Italy for me. Um, Char is asking, I've noted that she noticed a trend of enrobing cooked vegetables, sweet potatoes, raw fruits. Is it best to store in the fridge or freezer? Char, um, if I... By enrobing, I'm assuming you mean dipping them into a melted chocolate or a chocolate ganache because that's what enrobing means to me like this like these little oranges for example so it's best to depending on you know what it is that you're doing raw fruits i would keep them in the fridge if you don't want your fruit or fresh vegetable to be frozen they'll be nice and shiny when you first dip and the, they may dull, they will likely, the coating will likely dull in the refrigerator. But if you leave it at room temperature, it should just be fine. So I'd like to know about that. That sounds great. Hi, Laura. Laura says, hi, Chef Fram. What do you think of rice milk chocolate morsels by Enjoy Life? Well, I have them right here. <laughs> and um, Laura is enjoying the flavor and they're making excellent chocolate chip cookies. So that is the answer, right? Um, whether I like the flavor of them or not, doesn't matter. Laura likes them. And I'm sure Laura isn't the only one. And Enjoy Life is one of the companies that is absolutely certified gluten-free they are so there is that and that's that's a good thing so laura i'm glad that you like them hi linda linda's saying ciao you know i never really know how to pr 
pronounce it, C-H-O chocolate bars are delicious. I agree with you. It's a wonderful chocolate company and they have a variety of plant-based flavors and are fair trade. So yes, I like them. And they have come out recently with more and more plant-based. You know, it's really interesting because a company like Valrona, which is a French chocolate maker, they didn't, you know, they didn't speak vegan for a really long time. Um, I did a class at the Valrona Academy in Dumbo in Brooklyn. And um, it was some time ago, but now look at this. This is their 80% cacao chocolate noir. And it says fair trade. It says vegan. It's a B Corp and all that. So, you know, more and more companies are jumping in. And the fact is that's because people have asked for it. We vote with our forks. So if you're concerned, if we're, you know, concerned about child labor, let the chocolate companies know it's not okay. I don't use ever Hershey's or Nestle um, because they are notorious for using child labor. Now, Hershey's, I understand, had said by the year, I think it was originally 2023, and that's past, they would stop using child labor, but they haven't. And these companies have been sued. So I'm not using them. And they do have a line of vegan, non-dairy chocolates, but I personally don't buy them. I'm not judging you. You know, it's a decision for each of us to make, but I'm going to go for fair trade. The fair trade label, some people are saying, is not what it used to be. There's, um, it's expensive for small chocolate makers and so on, but there are other labels. Get to know the companies you're dealing with. That's the very best thing to do. Judy P., let's see, if you need to watch fats and fat content, isn't the fat higher, the higher the percentage of cocoa and cocoa butter? Well, there is fat in chocolate, that's for sure. Um, so in the higher percentage, you're going to have less sugar, you're going to have more cocoa mass, which is the unsweetened chocolate. And then if you, you know, do the math or you look at the, I think on the back of everything now, it tells you what the percentage of fat is, you're going to have more. And <laughs> so eat, you know, eat less and eat a little bit, but let's just look at this Theo bar because it's big enough for me to be able to see. It says three servings per container, one third of a bar, 28 grams. And you know, I bet you all know that that gets really tricky. And so the total fat per serving of this 70% chocolate is 14%. So you have to decide for yourself how that is. I would imagine, you know, is it considerably more in the 80%, maybe a little bit more? But that's, you know, that's what I would have to say about that. I'm going to end by saying what I said in the beginning that, you know, chocolate, like all desserts, is a treat and is not meant to be eaten every single day or eat it in reasonable quantities when you are also eating a healthy diet. Now, I just you know, I, I'm saying, or I'm saying to myself, I don't eat it every single day. I do have a square of chocolate maybe every, almost every day. But Dr. Michael Greger, who I imagine many of you are, know him and listen to nutritionfacts.org, has been saying that a tablespoon of non-alkalized cocoa, and I'm talking about unsweetened chocolate, not hot chocolate mix, but unsweetened chocolate. So cocoa powder, 
non-alkalis, and that could also be what's labeled as cacao per day is a very healthful, is, is really is a healthful thing to do in your life. So I have, I eat oatmeal almost every single morning. My breakfast is always steel cut oats with blueberries, flax, chia seed, and cinnamon varam. And I've been adding a tablespoon of non-alkalized cocoa. I don't know if I feel any different, but you know, and, and it's bitter because there's no sugar in it, but I think Dr. Gregor is great. And I love the idea of this. So I'm going to give it a try. So many people say, you know, chocolate is really healthful. It does have some health benefits to it, but you would have to eat a lot of it. And very few of us are going to want to eat completely unsweetened chocolate. So, you know, you kind of have to use your common sense on that. Let me know. You can write to me at friend at ruby.com if you try any of these new chocolates. If you find a vegan white chocolate that you like or a rice milk chocolate or an oat milk chocolate. And also, if there are some that you don't like, you know, the more that we can talk to each other about these things, the better it is. So it looks like I have no more questions. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for being here. I hope I will see you next month and have a great rest of the day or evening. Bye.